I grew up in Europe and uh, World War II caught me when I was between seven and ten years old and uh, I realized how few of the grown-ups that I knew were able to withstand the uh, uh, tragedies that the war uh, visited on them. How few of them could uh, even resemble a normal, uh, contented, satisfied, happy life once their uh, uh, job, their home, their security was uh, destroyed by the war. So I became interested in understanding uh, what uh, contributed to a life that uh, was worth living. And I tried as a child, uh, as a teenager, to read philosophy and to get involved in art and uh, religion and, and many other ways that I could see as a possible answer to that question. And uh, finally I ended up um, encountering psychology by chance, actually I, I was at a ski resort in Switzerland without any money to actually enjoy myself because the, the, the snow had melted and there was, I didn't have money to go to a movie but I found that um, on the, uh, reading the newspapers that there was to be a, a presentation uh, by someone in, in a place that uh, seemed in the center of Zurich and uh, it was um, about flying saucers he was going to talk and I thought well since I can't go to the movies at least I will go uh, for free to listen to flying saucers and the man uh, who talked uh, at that uh, evening uh, lecture uh, was very interesting and it actually instead of talking about little green man he talked about how the psyche of the Europeans had been traumatized by the war and now they are projecting flying saucers into the sky kind of as a he talked about how the mandalas of uh, ancient Hindu religion were kind of projected into the sky as a, a attempt to regain some f sense of order after the chaos of war. And this seemed very interesting to me and I started reading his books uh, after that lecture and that was Carl Jung whose, whose uh, name or work I, I had no idea about. Then I came to this country to study psychology and uh, I started trying to understand the, these roots of happiness. This is a typical result that many people have uh, presented and there are many variations on it. But this, for instance, shows that about 30% of the people surveyed in the United States since 1956 say that their life is very happy. And that hasn't changed at all, whereas the personal income on a scale that has been held constant to accommodate for inflation has more than doubled, almost tripled in that period. But you find essentially the same results, namely that after a certain basic point, which corresponds more or less to just a few thousand dollars above the minimum poverty level, increases in material well-being don't seem to affect how happy people are. And in fact, you can find that um, the lack of basic resources, material resources, contributes to unhappiness, but the uh, increase in uh, material resources do not increase happiness. So my research has been focused more on after uh, finding out these things that actually uh, corresponded to my own experience, I tried to understand now where in everyday life, in our normal experience, do we, do we feel really happy? And to 
start that uh, those studies about 40 years ago I began to look at uh, creative people first artists and scientists and so forth trying to understand what made them uh, feel that uh, it was worth uh, essentially spending their life doing things for which many of them didn't expect either fame or fortune but which made their life meaningful and worth uh, doing. This was one of the leading composers of American music back in the 70s and the interview was 40 pages long but this little excerpt is a very good summary of what he was saying during the um, interview and it describes how he feels when composing is going well. And he starts by describing it as an ecstatic state. Now, ecstasy in Greek meant simply to stand to the side of something. And then it became um, essentially a, an analogy for a mental state where you feel that you are not doing your ordinary everyday routines. So ecstasy is essentially a stepping into an alternative uh, reality. And it's interesting if you think about it how when we think about the civilizations that we look up to as having been pinnacles of human achievement, whether it's China, Greece, in, uh, Hindu civilization, or the Mayas, or Egyptians, what we know about them is really about their ecstasies, not about their everyday life. We know the temples they built so where people could come to experience a different reality. We know about the circuses, the arenas, port arenas, the theaters. These are the uh, remains of civilizations and they are the places that people went to experience life in a more concentrated, more uh, ordered uh, form. Now this man doesn't need to go to a place like this, which is also this place, uh, this arena, which is built like a Greek amphitheater, is a place for ecstasy also. We are participating in a reality which is different from that of everyday life that we are used to. But this man doesn't need to go to there. He needs just a piece of paper where he can put down little marks and as he does that he can imagine uh, sounds that had not existed before in that particular combination. So when, once he gets to that point of beginning to create, like Jennifer did in her improvisation, a, a new reality, that is a moment of ecstasy. He enters that different reality. Now he says also that this is so intense an experience that it feels almost as if it didn't exist. And that sounds like um, a kind of a romantic exaggeration, but actually our nervous system is incapable of processing more than about 110 bits of information per second. And in order to hear me and understand what I'm saying, you need to process about 60 bits per second. That's why you can't hear more than two people. You can't understand more than two people talking to you. Well, in, when you are really involved in this um, uh, completely engaging process of creating something new, as this man does, he doesn't have enough attention left over to monitor how his body feels or his problems at home. He can't feel even that he's hungry or tired. His body disappears, his identity uh, disappears from his consciousness because he doesn't have enough attention, like none of us do, to really do well something that requires a lot of concentration and at the same time to feel that he exists. So existence temporarily suspended. And he says that his hand seems to be moving by itself. Now, I could, uh, I could look at my hand for two weeks and I wouldn't feel any awe or wonder because I can't <laughs> compose. 
But so what he's not telling you here, but in other parts of the interview, is that obviously this uh, automatic, spontaneous uh, process that he's describing can only happen to someone who is very well trained and who has developed technique. And in, uh, it has become a kind of a truism in the study of creativity that you can't be creating anything with less than 10 years uh, of uh, technical knowledge immersion in a, in a particular field. Whether it's mathematics or music, it takes that long to be able to, uh, to uh, begin to change something in a way that it's better than what was there before. Now, when that happens, he says, the music just flows out. And because all of these people I started interviewing, this was an interview which is over 30 years old. Um, so many of the people described this as a spontaneous flow that I called this um, type of experience the flow experience. And it happens in different realms, for instance. A poet describes it in this form. This is by a student of mine who interviewed some of the leading writers and poets in the United States. And it describes the same effortless, spontaneous feeling that you get when you enter into this ecstatic state. This poet describes it as opening a door that floats up in the sky. Very similar description to what Albert Einstein gave as to how he imagined the forces of relati uh, relativity when he was struggling with trying to understand how it worked. Um, but it happens in other activities. For instance, this is another student of mine, Susan Jackson from Australia, who did work with some of the leading athletes in the world. And you see here in this description of an uh, Olympic skater, the same essential description of the phenomenology of the inner state of the person. You don't think it goes automatically. You merge yourself with the music and so forth. It happens also actually in the most recent book I wrote called Good Business where I interviewed some of the CEOs who have been nominated by their peers as being both very successful and very ethical, very socially responsible. You see that these people define success as something that helps others and at the same time makes you feel happy as you are working at it. And like all of these successful and uh, responsible CEOs say, um, you can't have just one of these things to, to be successful. Um, uh, if you want a meaningful job and successful job, Anita Radic is another one of these CEOs we interviewed. She is the founder of Body Shop, the cosmetic, kind of natural cosmetic thing. It's kind of a passion that comes from doing the best and having flow while you're working. This is an interesting little quote from Masaru Ibuka, who was at that time starting out Sony without any money, without a product. They didn't have a product, they didn't have anything, but they had an idea. And the idea he had was to establish a place of work where engineers can feel the joy of technological innovation, be aware of their mission to society, and work to their heart's content. I couldn't improve on this as a good example of how flow enters the workplace. Now, when we do studies, we have, with other uh, colleagues around the world, done over 8,000 interviews of people from Dominican monks to uh, blind nuns to Himalayan climbers to Navajo shepherds who enjoy their work. And regardless of the culture, regardless of education or, or whatever, there are these seven conditions that seem to be there when a person is in flow. There's this focus that once it becomes intense, leads a sense of ecstasy, a sense of clarity. You know exactly what you want to do from one moment to the other. You get immediate feedback. You know that what you need to do is possible to do even though difficult. 
and sense of time disappears, you forget yourself, you feel part of something larger. And once those conditions are present, what you're doing becomes worth doing for its own sake. In our studies, we represent the everyday life of people in this simple scheme, and we can measure this very precisely, actually, because we give people electronic pagers that go off 10 times a day, and whenever they go off, you say what you're doing, how you feel, um, where you are, what you're thinking about, and two things that we measure is the amount of challenge people experience at that moment, and the amount of skills that they feel they have at that moment. So for each person, we can establish an average, which is the center of the diagram. That would be your mean level of challenge and skill, which will be different from that of anybody else. But you have a kind of a set point there, which would be in the middle. If we know what that set point is, we can predict fairly accurately when you will be in flow, and it will be when your challenges are higher than average and skills are higher than average. And you may be doing things very differently from other people, but for everyone, that flow channel, that area there, will be when you are doing what you really like to do. Play the piano, probably. Be with your best friend. Perhaps work, if work is what provides flow for you. And then the other areas become less and less positive. Arousal is still good because you are over-challenged there. Uh, your skills are not quite as high as they should be. But you can move into flow fairly easily by just developing a little more skill. So arousal is the area where most people learn from because that's where they are pushed beyond their comfort zone and that to enter going back to flow then they develop higher skills. Control is also a good place to be because there you feel comfortable but not very excited. It's not very challenging anymore and if you want to enter flow from control you have to increase the challenges. So those two are ideal and complementary areas from which flow is easy to go into. The other combinations of challenge and skill become progressively less optimal. Relaxation is fine, you still feel okay. Boredom begins to be very aversive. And apathy becomes very negative. You don't feel that you're doing anything, you don't Use your skills, there's no challenge. Unfortunately, a lot of people's experience is in apathy. Uh, the largest single um, contribu contributor to that experience is watching television. The next one is being in the bathroom sitting. And then, um, even though sometimes uh, watching television about seven to eight percent of the time is in flow, but that's when you choose a program you really want to watch and you get uh, feedback from it. So the question we are trying to address, and I'm way over time, is how to put more and more of uh, everyday life in that flow channel. And that is the kind of challenge that we are trying to understand. And some of you obviously know that how to do that spontaneously without any advice, but unfortunately a lot of people don't, and that's what our um, mandate is in a way to do. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you.